Good afternoon and welcome to the lecture 21 of ETC 779. In this class, we are going to discuss about the risk analysis. Now, if you try to define risk, there could be number of possible definitions. You take the dictionary and find the meaning of risk, you will find a number of interpretation for the term risk. Now, this particular risk analysis, what we are going to study today is part of risk management. So, if you look at the entire risk management process, you will find that risk analysis is a step in that. Risk management is a very broad subject and this can be taken up as an entire course itself, separate course itself. We are not going to look into the details of overall risk management, but we are concerned as far as risk is concerned for our problems related to economic evaluation. You must be aware of the fact that whatever problem till now we have discussed, we have assumed that whatever we are assuming, whatever we are estimating, they are likely to be occurring in real situation also. We try to deviate from this particular assumptions when we discuss sensitivity analysis and break even analysis. There we try to vary our assumptions one by one, sometimes two taken together, sometimes more than two taken together and they try to find out the impact of these changes on our evaluation of alternatives, on our decision basically. But till now, we have not considered the probability of occurrence of the estimates that we had prepared. For example, we assumed that the interest rate is going to be 10 percent throughout the planning horizon, let us say 5 years, 7 years, 10 years. Now, this assumption does not look very sound because you will find that in real life situation, the interest undergoes changes quite frequently. Even within an interval of 2 to 3 months, you will find there is a change of interest rates. So, under such circumstances, our assumption of constant interest rate does not look good, does not sound good. So, risk analysis tries to associate certain probability values of occurrence of different interest rates over the period of time. So, I can say that well, there is a probability of 30 percent that the interest rate would be 10 percent, whereas there is a 50 percent chance or probability that the interest rate would be 12 percent. And maybe there is a 15 percent, uh, may, maybe there is 10 percent or 20 percent chance that interest rate would be this much. So, remember what additional thing we are discussing right now? We are discussing the probabilistic aspect. So, basically, when we consider risk analysis, we just cannot separate it from probability values. So, it is nothing but probabilistic approach of the problems that we have already undertaken. Uh, in the previous lectures. So, we will start with the very simple problems to start with and then we will gradually move on to slightly complex problems. See, just now I gave you the example of changes in interest and the associated probability values. There could be different probabilities of incomes. Till now, we have been assuming constant income. Let us say for year 1, we are receiving 100,000 rupees. For year 2, we are receiving 200,000 rupees. Now, we will associate different probability values corresponding to these returns or these incomes or these expenditures. So, this is the focus of our today's lecture, today's discussion. We are going to learn first the basic aspects of probability, basic concepts of probability and then we will try to restrict our discussion 
only to the problems or the type of problems that we have covered till now. Because as I mentioned in the beginning, the scope for risk analysis rather risk management is very vast. We just cannot cover them in one or two lectures. It is an entire subject in itself. So, we will try to restrict our discussion to the problems that we have solved in our previous lectures and that will be the focus of today's as well as tomorrow's lecture. I am planning to cover risk analysis in two lectures and that is why I have kept only the most relevant part as far as risk analysis is concerned. But for just for your information, you can understand that risk management is a very vast area. It consists of identification of different risks. Suppose you are putting up a plant, there could be different risks. There could be technological risk, there could be political risk, there could be social risk, there could be risk involved with procurement processes, there could be endless amount of risks. So, as a manager, your first step is to identify those risks. Then the next step would be to analyze these risks independently. What is the consequences of the risk? That is also analyzed separately. Now, once you have identified the risk, once you have made the priority of risk, then the next step is to mitigate these risks. So, you have different strategies. Sometimes you try to avoid that risk. Sometimes you try to share that risk. Sometimes you try to transfer that risk to somebody else. And sometimes you try to absorb that risk by having proper calculations. So, there are different risk management strategies. We are not going to look into all these aspects we are more or less we are concerned about the analysis part alone and that too analysis restricted to the economic evaluation of alternatives. That is the prime area for today's as well as tomorrow's discussion. Now, if you look at this particular slide, it clearly says it is part of risk management. That means, risk analysis is nothing but part of risk management, which consists of risk identification, risk analysis and evaluation, mitigation, etc. Now, as we discussed just now, risk analysis is closely associated with different concepts of statistics as well as probability. That is why it is very, very important to understand some key terms such as what is meant by additive probability, what is meant by joint probability, what is multiplication of probabilities, what is meant by expected value, what are the different measures of variation. These things some of you may be already exposed to in your undergraduate classes, but just to bring your bring you to this particular discussion, I will introduce these terms to you. Uh, in a very brief. We will not be discussing them in detail, but what I have done is I have tried to bring small examples and through this I will illustrate you these concepts very quickly. Once we are familiar with these concepts or rather once you recollect these concepts, we will straight away move to the risk analysis portion. Right. So, let us move on to additive probability. So, for this what I have done, I have taken a small problem from the textbook. You can note it down, I will read it out. The output of a machine has been classified into three grades. There is a machine which is producing certain product. Now, the output of these products have been classified into three grades superior grade, it is called here A grade, then there is a passing grade which is termed here as B grade and failing grade which is termed here as C grade. 
the items in each class from an output of 1000 items are 214 in A, 692 in B and 94 in C. That means there are 1000 output and out of this 214 belongs to A grade, 692 belong to B grade and 94 belongs to C grade. Now, if the run from which this sample was taken is considered typical, we have to determine the probability that the machine will turn out each grade of product. What is the probability that the machine will turn out each grade of product? Then the next question is, what is the probability of making at least a passable grade? What is the probability that you will produce at least a passable grade? So, if you just try to solve this problem, it is very simple in concept. It says you are producing three types of products, product A, product B, product C. Now, out of 1000 output, out of 1000 output, you find that 214 belongs to grade A, 692 belongs to grade B and 94 belongs to grade C. Now, we are asked to find the probability of each of these grades of product. So, you know what is the, if you try to look back or if you try to remember or recollect the definition of probability, you will find that the probability is defined as favorable events divided by total number of events. So, for finding the probability of getting grade A product, you can simply divide 214 that is probability of finding grade A material, grade A product is given by 214 by 1000. It is equal to 0 0.214. Similarly, I can calculate the probability of getting B grade material which is 692 by 1000 which is nothing but 0.692. And similarly, probability of getting C grade material is 94 divided by 1000, which is nothing but 0 0.094. Now, since we are discussing of additive probability, we can utilize the concept of our earlier knowledge on probability and then try to solve the second part of the problem. It says, what is the probability of making at least a possible grade? Now, except for grade C, these two are possible because this is possible and this is superior. B is possible, A is superior. So, only in case of C, it is failing. So, that means I am interested in finding the probability of A or B. And that is what is known as additive probability. I write it like probability of getting either product A or product B. So, whenever you find this statement or, you have to add the probability values. So, how will I do this? It will be simply 0 0.214 plus 0 0.692. This is the probability of getting possible grades, which includes probability of getting product B as well as product A. Now, this problem could have been solved other way also. I can find out the probability of failure grade or failing product 
probability associated with this is 0 0.094. So, if I subtract this value 0 0.094 from 1, I will get the answer for the second question. So, this is as far as additive probability is concerned. The moment you are supposed to find the probability of this or that, understand that you have to add the two probabilities individually and then that is your result. Now, we move on to the next concept that is multiplication of probabilities. Now, for this, I have given you again a very simple problem which is shown in the form of a decision tree. Now, the diagram shown on your slide is also sometimes referred to as decision tree. Now, this decision tree you will find that there are different nodes. They are represented either in circular node or in rectangular or square nodes. There are branches emerging from these nodes. So, what I have done in this particular problem is, I have assumed a scenario in which the interest rate can vary from 7 percent to 12 percent, not in continuous manner, but in discrete fashion. So, in one case, I am assuming that the interest rate could be 7 percent. In another case, I am assuming that the interest rate could be 10 percent. And finally, in third case, I am assuming that the interest rate could be 12 percent. I will just try to draw the decision tree here, because some of you may not be able to see that particular slide. So, as far as the question is concerned, I am just reproducing it. You have a node here, then you have an interest rate 12 percent, 10 percent and then 7 percent. Now, the probability to have 12 percent interest rate is given as 0.1. The associated probability for 10 percent interest rate is 0 0.7 and the associated probability corresponding to 7 percent interest rate is 0 0.2. So, this is as far as interest rate is concerned. So, what you find here is that there are uncertainties involved and that is what has been captured using probability values. Now, I am no longer assuming a single interest rate, which was the case in our earlier lectures. Now, here I have different values and associated with these values, I have different probability values. Now, if my interest rate is 12 percent, here again I have different possible values of annual savings. Let us say in one case it could be 5000 dollars, in another case it could be 8000 dollars and in another case it could be 10000 dollars and the associated probability values are 0 0.05, 0 0.85 and 0 0.10. This is nothing but annual saving. Likewise, I have got similar path for each of the interest rate. So, just try to note down the difference. Earlier, I was assuming a single value of annual saving and I was thinking that that value is going to be there throughout the project life. Now, I am at least having 3, 4 situations, 3, 4 likelihoods that okay, there is a 5 percent chance that 
saving could be $5,000. There is 85% chance that saving could be $8,000. And there is a 10% chance that the saving could be $10,000. The same thing has been repeated at other nodes also. If you look at this particular slide, you will find that the same thing has been repeated for other nodes also. Deliberately, I have kept same values for the annual saving. So, if it is 12 percent, the chance of occurrence of this interest rate is 10 percent, that is 0.1 probability and the savings could be $5,000, $8,000 or $10,000 with associated probabilities of 0 0.05, 0 0.85 and 0 0.10 respectively. Now, suppose looking at this particular diagram, somebody asked me, what is the probability that the interest rate is going to be 10 percent and the annual saving is going to be 8000? I will show you the question. You can note it down this particular thing. I am interested in finding the probability of interest rate 10 percent and an annual saving of 8000 dollar. So, notice the term and. So, whenever you, whenever you find this and that, you understand that this is a problem of multiplication of probabilities. Whereas, if you notice the term or, think that it is a case of additive probabilities. So, from the decision tree, you will be able to find the probability values, which will be nothing but 0.7 multiplied by 0.85, which is equal to 0.595. So, that means this is the probability that the interest rate will be at 10 percent and the annual saving would be at $8,000. Looking at the same diagram, you can try to answer the next question also. The probability of interest rate 7 percent and annual saving $10,000. Note the term and. So, 7 percent and a saving of $10,000, you can find it out from the decision tree it is 0.2 multiplied by 0.1, which gives 0 0.020. That means, there is a very low probability that interest rate is going to be 7 percent and your saving is going to be 10,000 dollar. But this is a likely possibility, although the occurrence pos uh, chances may be low. Remember this there could be, these could be possible scenarios. Although the chances of their occurrence may be low, for some, for some situations the chances of occurrence may be high. So, what we are doing differently in this lecture is, for each one of the variables, we are trying to have number of values and in addition to that, we are also assigning the probability of their occurrence. In the previous lectures, if you would have done similar type of problem, I would have given you a straight away the interest rate 10 percent, annual saving 9000 dollars, that is it. But here you can see the problems can be complicated because future is uncertain we do not know. So, what we are doing from our past experience, we are trying to establish certain probability values. These probability values are coming from statistics. The company may be having a statistics of last 10 years, 15 years, how the interest rates has interest rates have varied. From there, we are deriving this probability values. Remember the derivation of these probability values is one of the most difficult tasks. 
once you have been able to identify the probability, the calculation is not difficult. It is arriving at those probability values which matters because analysis can be performed by anyone, but only experts with the help of past data, with the help of their previous experiences can identify the probability values. But once it comes as a figure, numerical value, it becomes very simple to analyze. There is no problem at all as we will see. But the most difficult part is how to arrive those values. This was true for previous classes also. How to estimate the salvage value, how to estimate the interest rate, how to estimate the annual savings, how to estimate the annual expenditures. These are our problems of, these are our problems. Once we are able to identify those values, we do not have much of a problem. So, this is as far as multiplication of probabilities is concerned. Now, we will see some other important concept which is called expected value. Now, this is one of the very, very important term that you will find in risk analysis as well as in probability. If you try to define expected value in simple terms, you can try to draw a correspondence with weighted average. So, expected value is nothing but a weighted average. Suppose you are having two, three courses. Now, one course has a weight of 100, another course has a weight of maybe 50, another course may be having a weight of another 40. So, you know how to calculate the weighted average. So, expected value is also derived on similar lines. If you just try to find out the expected value for interest rate in this particular slide, can you tell me what would be the expected interest rate or rather what would be the expected value of interest rate? What is given here? You can see there is a 0.1 probability that the interest rate would be 12 percent. There is 0.7 probability that interest rate is going to be 10 percent and there is 0.2 probability that the interest rate is going to be 7 percent. So, if you want to find the expected value of interest rate, I do it like this, expected value of interest rate is given by 12 into 0 0.1 plus 10 into 0 0.7 plus 7 into 0 0.2. I think you will be getting its value as 9.6. In terms of percent, it is 9.6 percent. So, what you find? It is nothing but the weighted average you can understand that 12 percent is given 0.1 weightage or 10 percent weightage. 10 percent is given as 0.7 or 70 percent weightage. 7 percent is given as 0.2 or 20 percent weightage. So, we are multiplying different variable values with their associated weights in order to derive the composite weight and that composite weight itself is known as expected value. So, as far as this particular problem is concerned, the expected value of interest rate is nothing but 9.6 percent. Now, can you on the similar line, can you find the expected value of annual saving for any of the path you take? 
see five thousand dollar there is a probability of 0.05 eight thousand dollars we have a probability of 0 0.85 and ten thousand dollars we have a probability of 0 0.10 So, what is the expected value of annual saving? This you can do it by 5000 multiplied by 0 0.05, 8000 multiplied by 0 0.85 and 10000 dollar multiplied by 0 0.10. That would be the expected value of annual savings. Now, if you just try to go deeper into the concept of expected value, you must be familiar with the very common example of tossing a coin. Now, when you are tossing the coin and if the coin is unbiased, it will have equal probability of showing a head or a tail, right. Now, in some situation you may find that out of 10 trials you are doing, by chance it may so happen that 7 times you have got head and only in 3 occurrences you have you might have got tail. But that does not mean that the chance of getting head is 0.7 and the chance of getting tail is 0.3. So, whenever you are trying to evaluate the expected value, we assume that the experiment is conducted for very large number of times. Now, this experiment is nothing but tossing of coin. So, we assume that if the to uh, coin is tossed for very large number of times, you will find that the end result will show that it has got almost equal probability of showing a head and a tail. But if you are limiting the number of experiments, maybe in some cases you will find either it will be more heads or sometimes you will be getting more tails. So, whenever you are talking of expected value, think of very large number of experiments, very large number of trials. So, that is one thing that you have to keep in mind when discussing expected value, when talking of expected value. Think that there are large number of repetitions involved, there are large number of trials involved, right. So, here also if you see when you have calculated the expected value for interest rate, it is assumed, it is understood that this sort of experiments if performed over a long period of time, it is very very likely that the mean value or the expected value of interest rate would be 9.6. Now, sometimes it may so happen that interest rate could be 12 percent, exact 12 percent. Sometimes it could be so happening that interest rate is exact 10 percent and sometimes it will be so happening that interest rate is 7 percent. But that does not mean that the expected value is any one of these three values. No, that is not the case. If I perform doing this, uh, if I continue doing this experiment over a large period of run or trial, I will get a mean value of 9.6. That is what is meant by expected value. It is nothing but the mean value or the weighted value. Right. Now, what we do? I give you one problem as far as expected values is concerned. It is just to illustrate you the concept of expected values slightly in detail. So, you can note down this problem. 
this problem states you want to invest rupees 100,000. Now you have two proposals in hand. Proposal one is to invest in a stock. Stock is nothing but your share market, right? Option B is to invest in an infrastructure project. It could be anything, say telephones. Now the question says that the rate of return on the investment depends on the state of economy of the market. Every state has some chance of occurrence as given below. I will show you the slide. So what is happening? You have 1 lakh or 100,000 to invest. You can invest in either in a stock or you can invest in an infrastructure project. The rate of return with both these proposals varies according to the market situation, market conditions. What are the different market conditions? I will show you in this particular slide as well as I will write it on the page on this particular piece of paper. Right. The different states of economy are boom condition, normal condition and recession. Recession is nothing but slowing down of economy. So these are the three states. Either the economy could be booming or it could be normal or it could be having recession. Now the probability that there would be boom condition prevailing is 0.3, normal condition prevailing is 0.4 and recession again it is 0.3. Now let us say if you are investing in stocks, option 1, option A, you can get a return of 100 percent. If the market is normal, you can expect a return of this I am writing as return, 15 percent and if there is recession you have a probability of making 70 percent in negative also. That means if there is a boom market prevailing, you can expect a return of 100 percent on 100 lakhs or sorry 100,000. If there is a normal market situation, you can anticipate that you can get a return of 15 percent. But if there is slowdown of economy, if there is a recession, your investment can give you losses also because return is minus 70 percent. This is as far as option A is concerned. Now option B, that means if you are investing in infrastructure projects and boom condition prevails you can get a return of 20 percent. If normal condition prevails, you get a return of 15 percent and if recession prevails, you get a return of 10 percent. Now, Tell me between alternative A and B, which one you would choose? You have 100,000 rupees to invest, you have two options to invest. You can invest in a stock, you can invest in some infrastructure projects. Now there could be three types of possible market scenarios 
it could be having a boom time, it could be having a normal time, it could be having a recession. If there is a boom time and you are opting for stocks, that is option A, you can expect to get 100 percent return. In normal times, it is going to fetch you 15 percent return and in case it is a slowdown or recession, you are going to get minus 70 percent. Whereas in option 2, although the returns are less, 20 percent during boom time, 15 percent during normal time and 10 percent during recession time. Which option are you going to choose? So, for deciding on such type of problems, the first step that we need to do is to calculate the expected value of return for both the alternatives. So, just try to work out the expected value of return for alternative A as well as for alternative B. For alternative A, it would be 100 percent into 0 0.3 plus 15 percent into 0 0.4 and minus 70 percent into 0 0.3. Similarly, you can do it for option B, 20 percent multiplied by 0 0.3, 15 percent multiplied by 0 0.4 and 10 percent multiplied by 0 0.3. What you notice in this particular problem is that for both the cases, the expected value is coming to be 15 percent. Expected value, I write it like E v. Expected value for both the options, I am getting as 15 percent. Now, there is a very tough choice which one I, I must go for, whether I should go for option A or whether I should go for option B. Now, if you see as a layman itself the two options, you find that there is a very large variation as far as option A is concerned. The returns are varying from minus 70 percent to plus 100 percent. Whereas, in case of option B, returns are not varying much. So, in one case you can see for option A, the mean value is 15 percent and your values are varying from minus 70 to minus 100, sorry to plus 100. If you try to look at like this in the form of a diagram, let us say this is your expected value 15 percent. In one case it is varying from, let us say this is 0 somewhere here. minus 75 let us say somewhere minus 70 somewhere here and plus 100 somewhere here. So, what you find in alternative A, it varies from here to here. So, you find that there is a large deviation or dispersion from the mean. Whereas, if you take the second case, 15 percent is somewhere here, 20 percent is somewhere here and your values are varying from 10 percent to 20 percent, that is all. So, the spread or the dispersion or the deviation is very, very small as far as option B is concerned. Although, in both the cases, the expected value of return is same. Now, this dispersion or this variation from the mean value, 
is nothing but the risk involved with the uh, with different alternatives so when you find that there is a large chances of variation in your estimated value you say that that particular option is very very risky there could be large fluctuations so these fluctuations these inconsistency is nothing but your risk now there are different ways through which we calculate this variation there is a statistical term called variance then there is another term called a standard deviation and finally there is another term called coefficient of variation cv so you have variance which is sigma square standard deviation which is sigma and then you have coefficient of variation cv so these three terms you will find that they are very very useful as far as identifying the riskiness of a particular alternative we will discuss more about this sigma square sigma and cv but before that we want to do some more examples based on the concept of expected value once we measure once we start measuring this sigma square sigma cv we are really into risk analysis that i want to delay it for some time before that i want you to understand the concept of expected value more clearly because that is the fundamental thing until and unless we are clear of that concept we won't be able to proceed further so for this what i have done is i have taken another problem in which you find that the investment required to be made now is rupees 6000 that means at time t is equal to 0 you have to invest rupees 6000 now in year 1 you can expect a cash flow of 1500 3000 and 4000 what i will do i will just try to note down these figures here let's say this is a cash flow diagram representation right at time t is equal to 0 i have to invest 6000 rupees at the end of year 1 year 2 and year 3 i am given the cash flow values that means the returns that i am expecting to get i can expect to get a return of 1500 here it could be 3000 also it could be 4000 also here also 1500 3000 4000 here also 1500 3000 now the associated probability values are also given it is 0.25 0.5 and 0.25 similarly here also it is 0.25 0.5 and 0.25 here also it is 0.25 0.5 and 0.25 so it is like this you if you want you can have a diagram like this returns are shown on the plus side now just notice the difference between previous lectures and the lecture that we are having right now 
in the previous lectures we were having only single value here only single value here only single value here now we were assuming that these single values have a 100% chance of occurrence now notice the difference there is a 25% chance that i can receive 1500 rupees in year 1 there is a 50% chance that i can receive rupees 3000 in year 1 and there is again 25% chance that i will receive 4000 in year 1 same thing for year 2 i am not sure whether i am getting 1500 or 3000 or 4000 and that is happening in real life situation you just simply can't forecast exactly so now i have got two things to do one i have to estimate the different values that i am going to receive at the end of every year and besides this i also have to find out the probability of their occurrence if at all i want to do risk analysis so there lies the complication first of all i need to know more details and then i have to incorporate them into our calculations and then finally to perform the analysis so now what i do here is i calculate the expected value at the end of year 1 year 2 and year 3 so how i do this at time t is equal to 0 i am investing 6000 that is known to me that is for certainty that is for sure because we are dealing with time t is equal to 0 but when it comes to end of year 1 i will try to take the expected value so the expected value at end of year 1 is going to be 1500 multiplied by 0 0.25 plus 3000 multiplied by 0 0.5 plus 4000 multiplied by 0 0.25 how much is this coming it is coming to be 2875 so that means at the end of year 1 my expected returns are rupees 2875 now since all the values are same this value will be there for end of year 2 also as well as for end of year 3 if you wanted to make this problem more complicated in that case you can change these values for example this you can keep it as 0 0.5 this you can keep it as 0 0.25 and this you can keep it as 0.25 for this also you may make changes 0.25 and this you can keep it as 0.5 if you want to make the problem little more complicated so every year you have to calculate the expected value what would be the expected value for end of year 2 it is going to be 3125 and for year 3 which is nothing but 4000 multiplied by 0.25 plus 3000 multiplied by 0.25 plus 1500 multiplied by 0.5 is going to be I will just calculate it is coming to be 2500 now you are given the discount rate of 10 percent that means your interest rate is 10 percent now once i have got the expected value calculations with me i can easily find the net present value for this it is going to be minus 6000 plus 2875 
I am interested in finding P. I am given F at 10 percent year 1 plus 3125 P given F 10 percent year 2 plus 2500 P given F 10 percent year 3. So, this is how I calculate the net present value now. So, please note down the difference between our previous approaches and the current approaches. Here we are not assuming that some value at the end of year 1 is going to be constant we are assigning certain probabilities for different possible values of returns at end of year 1, at end of year 2 and at end of year 3. Is it clear technology class? Yes. Good. So, I think you will get some value of net present which is in positive. Now, I will take one more problem. I will give you the problem here itself. Let us see a decision tree something like this. I have to invest 200,000 now. I am expecting a return of rupees 80,000 in year 1 with a probability value of 0.3. I am expecting 110,000 with a probability value of 0.4 and 150,000 is expected which has a probability of 0.3. Now, if this condition prevails that means, if at the end of year 1 I am receiving 80,000. In year 2, I have a probability of receiving 40,000, 100,000, 150,000 with probability values of 0 0.2, 0 0.6 and 0.2. Again, if I am getting 110,000, I am expecting that I will get 130,000, 150,000 and 160,000 with the associated probability value of 0 0.3, 0 0.4 and 0.3. And finally, if I am getting 150,000 in year 1, I have a probability to get 160,000 in year 2 with a probability value of 0.1, 200,000, 200,000 with a probability values of 0.8 and 240,000 with a probability value of 0.1. Now, this is nothing but the return for year 1.
and this is nothing but the return for year 2. So, the problem is like this, if you are investing 200,000 dollar now, you have a chance that you can earn 80,000 dollar in year 1 with a probability value of 0 0.3, 110,000 dollar with a probability value of 0 0.4 and 150,000 with a probability value of 0 0.3. Now, if at the end of year 1 you are getting 80,000, then you have a chance that you can earn 40,000 dollar in year 2 with a probability value of 0 0.2. 100,000 with a probability value of 0.6 and 150,000 with a probability value of 0.2. If you are receiving 110,000 in year 1, you have a probability that you will receive 130,000 in year, one, uh, year 2 with a probability value of 0.3, 150,000 with a probability value of 0.4, 160,000 with a probability value of 0.3. And if you are receiving 150,000 at the end of year 1, you may expect to get 160,000 with a probability of 0 0.1, 200,000 with a probability of 0 0.8 and 240,000 with a probability of 0 0.1. Uh, did you note down the problem, technology class? Yes. Okay. Now, I was all the time referring to this, if you are receiving this, you are getting this. If you are receiving some money in year 1, you have a chance to get this much money in year 2. So, I was purposely doing that, just to show you that these two are dependent. The second return is, return for year 2 is dependent on the return of year 1. That point you have to note very carefully. The return of year 2 is dependent on the return of year 1. It is as good as saying that return of year 2 given return of year 1. In such cases, what we do is, we find out the joint probability. We find out the joint probability corresponding to each of the paths of the decision tree and then we perform other computations. For example, if you want to find the joint probability for this path, starting from here and then coming to this path. So, the joint probability value is 0.3 multiplied by 0.2. It is as good as multiplicative probability or multiplication of probability. So, this value becomes 0 0.06, this value becomes 0 0.18, this value becomes again 0 0.06. What I am doing? I am calculating the joint probability. And how do I read this? Probability that I will get a return of 80,000 at the end of year 1 and a return of 40,000 at the end of year 2 is given by 0 0.06, 0 0.3 multiplied by 0 0.2. Similarly, for this path, It is 0.3 multiplied by 0.6, which is 0.18. So, likewise, I calculate the joint probability for each of the paths. Just try to work it out the joint probability values corresponding to each of the paths.
Now once you have calculated the joint probability for each of the paths, we can calculate the net present value for each of the paths. How do we do that? For example, let us take this path, first one, I do it like this in a separate paper, 200,000 is the required investment at time t is equal to 0, I am getting a return of 80,000 and a return of 40,000 at the end of year 2. This is the cash flow diagram of path 1 in which I am getting a return of 80,000 at the end of year 1 and 40,000 at the end of year 2. Now if you assume that rate of interest is 12 percent, the net present value for this is going to be minus 200,000 plus 80,000 divided by 1.12 if you want to use the formula plus 40,000 divided by 1.12 whole square. This can be used by, this can be calculated by using factors also. But since these are only 2 years involved, there are only 2 years involved, I can very well do like this. So what I have done? I have calculated the net present value for path 1. I have also calculated the joint probability of path 1. Like this, I am going to do for all the paths in the decision tree. So once I have got a table like this in which I have got, let us say I call this as path 1, 2, 3 like this, path net present value, then I have probability, joint probability, joint probability, I can make a table. Path 1, what is the net present value? Minus 966, Minus 966 83, 83 6. 0.6. This is my net present value and joint probability was 0 0.06. Likewise, I can calculate for this second path, path 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 and 9. I can do it like this. So all these values you have to calculate. And then you calculate the weight. Weight of each path will be given by net present value multiplied by joint probability. So that means for this particular path, the weight would become minus 5801. Likewise, I have to calculate the weight for each of the 9 paths and then I have to sum it up. And the total weight, the summation of all the weights of different paths is giving me the net present value. Is the process clear to you technology class? Yes. Fine. So what we have discussed in this class is, I have just introduced you to the risk analysis. 
I have told you that this is part of overall risk management. Then I also told you that risk analysis is closely associated with application of statistics and probability and that is why we started with learning some probability concepts. We studied ADT probability, multiplicative probability, expected value and then we tried to solve certain illustrations, certain problems involving these concepts. In tomorrow's lecture, I will be covering other aspects of risk such as how to measure the variance, we will discuss standard deviation, we will discuss coefficient of variation and then finally, we will be going deeper into the other aspects of risk analysis. So, with this I close the lecture and if you have any doubts, you may please ask. Thank you and good night.